Good evening, my friends. I'm Tom. The color cast is on the air now for Thursday night. It's the 14th of January, 1999. My old friend Harlan Ellison, one of the country's great writers, is here tonight, and one of its best songwriters and performers, Paul Anka, joins us as well, along with you on the toll-free line, and I want to get to them as quickly as I can. Ellison is always serious, and I'd like to be serious here for a second tonight. You know, over the Christmas holiday, I was at dinner one night with about six or eight people, and the subject of hungry kids came up, and somebody at the table threw out the figure that 25% of all the children in America go to bed hungry every night. Now, I question the number 25%. You know, sometimes the do-gooders around us raise the bar just a little bit. But if 1% of the American kids go to bed hungry every night, that is too many. And I recall reading in the paper at about the same time that we had sent $150 million of food to Russia because they're in tough shape as well. And I thought to myself, if we can send $150 million worth of food to Russia, can't we feed hungry children in America? And coincidental with all of this, I got a little bonus from my own private corporation, which is called Colortini Incorporated at the end of the year this year. Let's say it was $1,000. It was more, but let's say it was 1000 In taxes, they took 600, 60%. You know, when you go to a restaurant and you have a meal, you get an itemization of where your money went. You know, what went for drinks, what went for appetizers, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't it be nice if when we paid our taxes, you're nodding your heads out there, I hope, they would give us back a little itemized receipt of where our money went and how much went to feed kids that are going hungry in this country. Uh, second point, last night I talked here about two of my teachers back at Marquette High. Father Disler, once you go out that door, out that door, you never return, return, all right. And Father Manhart, who taught us uh, first year Latin. Uh, we heard from somebody today that Father Manhart is alive and well at the age of 101, living in suburban St. Louis, Missouri. He is the oldest Jesuit father living in the United States. He taught me, for God's sake, and I know he probably isn't watching, but if somebody who knows him is, please give him my best and give him all of our love. He was truly a great inspiration and a great teacher. Back with Harlan Ellison and then Paul Anka. I'm Tom. You're watching CBS, and thanks for catching our pictures as we fly him through the air. Harlan Ellison is the award-winning author of literally thousands of short stories, novels, commentaries, and articles, and as all of you know, is one of our more frequent guests. And for what might be the last time, I'm pleased to welcome him to CBS. Thanks for coming on. And pathetically and sadly, I'm sorry to say that it may be the last time. As I was saying to someone earlier, when you go, that's the end of it. That's the end of it. That's the end of it. Yep. It, it is all done. You're the last person I know who actually reads what he, uh, of the things that people he talks to have done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but this, this is the... You are the only man I know, and I call you at home now and again because you call and we exchange jokes on the phone. Yes, we do, and I have one for you. All right, whenever you answer the phone, you don't say hello, you say, yeah. Well... What, what, what is, yeah, what, what, what is that? I get an enormous number of uh, nutcase calls. <laughs> I can't imagine and why. <laughs> despite the fact that I am basically one of the sweetest people in this hemisphere, I, I feel that instilling instant fear into anyone is a good way to, to act. Also, people call me from the industry, uh -huh. and there's nothing I like better than annoying and antagonizing people in suits who think that they are the, the creators instead of me. It's, it's just another manifestation of my arrogance. I've got to tell you, this, God calls in Jesus. He says, you've got to die. Jesus says, what are you talking about? I've got to die. He says, I'm sorry. That's the way it's going to go. It's, I got it written that way. You've got to die. He says, boy, go be the son of God like you get some dispensation here. He says, God says, but don't worry. We're going to give you, you got your choice of ways to go. He says, oh, big deal. He said, you can be crucified. He said, oh, terrific. <laughs> Crucifixion, that's lovely. What's the alternative? He says, well, we could have you, I don't know, stung to death by 80,000 maddened bees. And that is why, to this day, Catholics go like this instead of... <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That's very, very good. Isn't that nice? Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't tell you that one over the phone because you have to see it. Yeah, I see. Have you always been a man? As a boy, were you a passionate kid? Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, committed yeah. to ideas, committed to causes? Well, I was, I was, yeah, I was very passionate, but unfortunately in Painesville, Ohio... Uh, passion always turned like that kid's going to wind up in prison. He'll be dead. You know, they always predicted hideous things for me, and as you can see, they came to pass. Uh, there was no place to go with the passion. There was nothing to do with the energy except get in trouble. Which I mean, I were you creative? Did you have ideas about oh, yeah. stories and fantasies and stuff like Absolutely. that? And no place to to exhibit. When that. I was a little kid, I used to draw my own comic books, hideously drawn, 
and uh, the balloons I would you put on. I had one of those little typewriters, you know, where you turn the wheel and yeah, press yeah. on again. And I and I would do it. I'm gonna copy maybe three or four copies with with it with it with a carbon paper, and I would staple them together and then take them around and sell them in the neighborhood. And if people didn't buy them, I would break their windows. He said that's how I learned marketing very early in life. <laughs> Did you mystify your parents? Did they understand you at all? My, my mom and dad had loved me. They, they, they just loved me, and they, and they treated me terrifically. But they didn't have a clue. I mean, the poor devils. It was, it was, it was, it was, I swear it was like a pair of nice, pleasant pandas had given birth to a catamount or, or, or some sort of hideous slug creature from aliens. They didn't know what the hell to do with me. And periodically, my mother would have to just get away. And my, my father, I mean, they would just say, that's it, you know, and they would run shrieking into the streets and go away for a while and, uh, and leave me at summer camps where I would get the crap beaten out of me. And we've talked about this. You were a small kid. You were very small, small. smallest five, in the class. Five, very, very, very tiny. And uh, I was smallest than this. I was smaller than the smallest girl. There's this picture. Well, you've, you've shown it on this show. The picture of my, I think it's my fifth grade at Lathrop Grade School. Uh, 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 yes, we have shown that. Yeah. You have shown it, and, 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 and the, the person who's only as short as I is a lovely woman named, named Jeannie Bittner. Her, her married name is Pengal. She lives down in, uh, in Fairport, Ohio, uh, with her husband, and uh, she was my first date, and, and you can see the two of us. We're little Edie Bittner. Have little... you been back like to a high school reunion? Oh, no, man. Are you kidding? To Painesville? No, no. No, I went back to Painesville a number of years ago uh, when, I was, uh, when I was much younger and in real good fit condition. Uh, after working out with uh, some martial arts people and uh, ran into the bully who had beaten me up all my life. And there he was sitting with a big fat beard gut in the bar of the Parmley Hotel, which I had always thought was this great, beautiful hotel, yeah. but it was like miserable, wretched thing out of death of a salesman, you know. And there he sat. He was at that time, a, uh, uh, I think, a, a milkman or a used car salesman or something. And his little bitty piggy eyes kind of fastened on me and he remembered who I was uh, and, and I could see the, 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 the synaptic relays, relays trying to close, you know, Ellison, punch, hit. And he started to get off the stool, and I thought, must oh. Must hit Ellison. Must hit Ellison. And I thought, oh, thank you, thank you. And I was waiting for him. And he must have perceived that I was ready for him because he just got back up on the bar stool and drank. Uh, you went off to New York to seek your fortune, as most kids who are born east of the Mississippi do. And you got there and you had a variety of occupations, I read this afternoon. Yes. You were a sanitation worker, a bridge painter. Tell me about these jobs that you had, and, you know, to support your writing when you were a struggling young writer. Well, the, the, the jobs that I held were, I mean, being non-union and being totally unskilled, you know, at any, at any mm -hmm. major job, I had to take whatever non-union job I could find. And one of the jobs was uh, they paint the uh, uh, Brooklyn Manhattan Bridge uh, with rust-resistant paint. Uh, I don't know whether they still do it, but they used to do it, the underside of it because of the spume from the river. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, and I would hang upside down in a cradle, painting it with rust-resistant paint. Uh, uh, from, I've heard that you go from one end to the other, and then you start all you over start again. start all over I've again. heard the same of the Golden Gate yeah, Bridge and some yeah. of the bridges up in Northern California. And it is a scary job, and I didn't do it for very long. And then I worked, uh, then I worked uh, picking up uh, garbage at uh, Bryant Park uh, with a stick with a nail on the end of it. I like that. Uh, and uh, I worked at the Broadway Bookshop between the Victoria and Astor Theaters between 45th and 46th Streets. Selling? Uh, books, uh, the Modern Library, semi-pornography, not real pornography. Gotcha. The Alcoholic Woman by Van de Velde, you know, and then I would point to the one chapter that said her labia. The, you know, I mean, in those days, the word labia was already, forget it, that you could, you know, that was already pornographic. And switchblades. I, uh, I had learned how to operate a switchblade knife. Uh, a a non-button knife, a non-switch mm -hmm. knife, uh, an Italian stiletto, faster by hand, just by flipping it, than they could with a button. And the kids would come in from the Bronx and Brooklyn and from out of town, and they would say, hey, look at that, man, look at the size of that. And I would say, oh, you want to see something? And the knife would be this long closed, and I would go, <laughs> and I'd have it at their throat. And it was this far away from them, and they said, ooh, I want to buy one of those. <laughs> so I became very valuable in the bookstore. How much did you hate all these jobs while you were doing them? Oh, I loved them. Oh, did you really? I loved them. I loved them. I, 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 like, working, I like working with my hands, and I like working uh, um, among people who are not all concerned with what everything means. Mm -hmm. They just like doing whatever they do. I, I used to throw garbage. The best job I ever had was throwing garbage. I was, I was one of the guys in the morning who picks up the cans and... He was in the back of the truck. Throws yeah. in the back of the truck and then throws the can as noisily as possible <laughs> back onto the side <laughs> because at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, if I have to be up throwing garbage, everybody else, everybody else will be up as well. And uh, I loved that job. Uh, in fact, to this day, when they come for the garbage, in, you know, my house, I'm out there every Wednesday morning and I'm waving to the guys and I'm taking the cans, except now they got the 
the hooks that pick up yeah, the exactly, cannon. Exactly, it's yeah. not, not like the good old days. Nah, huh? <laughs> they, what do they know from real garbage? Yeah. <laughs> We're chatting here with writer Harlan Ellison. The toll free is up and running. We're going to answer the phone tonight the way he does. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be right back after these messages. <laughs> We're back with uh, writer Harlan Ellison. Now, I want to talk to you about your performing career here. One of your jobs, you sang in the choir or the chorus of Kismet when you were in yes, New York. Yes, one, one of the jobs that I had, because I had a background as a singer, one of the jobs I had for a small time was singing in the chorus uh, in Kismet. And uh, if I'd not had the Asian flu for nine days, I could probably hit the high note. But if you listen to the original cast recording of Kismet, mm -hmm. you will be able to hear me sing, Marzana, buy from me. Or something like something that. Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> and uh, uh, that didn't, job didn't last very long, but, it, it, but, but, but somebody asked me, did I enjoy it? I said, yeah, I met some of the most attractive women in the world. Sure. And, uh, and on the Broadway stage. Uh, huh? A lot of action for a young man. It was a good thing. I got another joke for you. No, that's okay. You don't want another so one. So let me continue now on your performing career, because you're going to appear in a production called, what is it, The Psy Factor? It, I had not acted in 40 years. I used to be, I was at the Cleveland Playhouse. Uh, Jose Ferrer thought I had talent, wanted me to come to Broadway. Uh, I had not been anywhere near a script except for doing my commentaries on a, another channel mm -hmm. and, uh, and shows like this. But I had not been near a script in 40 years and I got a call from Canada from a marvelous little syndicated show called Psy Factor that they shoot in Toronto. Uh, 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 the producer called me and he said, look, we, we would like you to come and play a role. Mm -hmm. Will you play a role as an alien? Mm -hmm. Now, would this Psy Factor be like Psy... PSI. As oh, in PSI, not, PSI like, like, not SCI. It, it, the show is a lot like sort of X-Files light. Oh, okay. The star is Matt Frewer. It's a marvelous cast of Canadian actors. It's syndicated. It's on uh, here in Los Angeles, I think, on Sunday nights, quite late. It's one of those shows that's on at such obscure hours that no one can ever find it. Mm -hmm. But it's really quite a nice little show. It's produced on a budget. And uh, they treated me like uh, I was Eleanor Aduza, for God's sakes. <laughs> and they brought me up to, uh, to Canada. And, uh, Eleanor Aduza. <laughs> Eleanor Aduza. And... Uh, or Mickey Rooney, either yeah. one, whichever comes first. <laughs> and I uh, and I did this and I did this acting job, and it was a wonderful. Yeah, but experience. Now usually you have great disdain for television, for production, for poor writing. So apparently this project was of sufficient quality to uh, to induce you to do it. Well, it was it was well that and the fact that they offered me a very nice sum of money that too. to come and and and, and I, all I hoped that I would not embarrass myself, mm -hmm. not having been in front of a camera in in forty years kidding really yeah sure. uh, we shot it from uh, they had to shoot different different angles of sure, course sure. and uh, they had a sh uh, but uh, no it was it was one take uh, I was uh, I'm I had impressed I'm impressed well why I'm old I ain't senile and ain't hard well, to I know lines. But, it's, but you know hitting marks and memorizing lines that can be you know you could trip a word or have to do it again working with Matt Frewer is the easiest and we we got along we got along like a couple of cats in a bag man I mean it was just funny in fact if we had to do retakes it was because we kept breaking each other up he would say something I would say you know you speak with a very funny accent and then he would do a thing and then we'd fall apart and everybody would laugh uh, but it was it, I, I was just pleased as punch that it went so well and what I got all done they gave me a standing ovation. Oh, very nice. And I said, oh, God, they're glad to get rid of me. And the, uh, and the AD said, no, no, they really think you're good. I can't believe Harlan Ellison uses the phrase, pleased as punch. Here is Kip on the toll free in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, how you doing tonight? Okay, Kip, how are you? <laughs> oh, very good, very good. Good, good. Pleased as punch you're here, Kip. <laughs> the question I want to ask is, where, where can an, inspire, an inspiring writer get inspiration? Well, that's like, that's like asking where can someone who has religious faith get faith. Uh, you either have talent or you don't. The mechanics can be taught. Anybody can be taught to write. I mean, uh, if you read Judith Krantz, you know the things that grow in Petri dishes could be, you know, on the bestseller list. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> meaning no offense to real writers. Uh, you read good books, read good books, read good writers. That's where you get the inspiration. And uh, the more you read good writers, you will learn how good writing is done. I, I, I mean, that's a fast answer. You're asking me to give you what I would ordinarily uh, <coughs> come up with in about a week at a writer's workshop. Okay. Thanks, Kip. Thank you. Stay out of trouble. Great now. show, Tom. All right. Thanks, Kip. Be careful bye -bye. and stay well. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah. Bye-bye. All right. We will continue with Harlan Ellison. Still ahead is Paul Anka. You on the toll-free right after this break. With Harlan Ellison, here's Casey on the toll-free in Meshoppin, Pennsylvania. Hi, Casey, and welcome to CBS Late Night. Hello. How are you tonight, Okay, Tom? thanks. 
Yeah, my question is, is uh, why is it that the short story has almost disappeared? That's a great question, by the way. Yeah, well, this, this, that, the tradition of the short story, which is where writers learn how to write, you would write 10, 20, 30 short stories, then you'd go to a novelette, then you'd learn a novella, then you would try a novel. Well, when the paperback books came in and uh, people demanded novels, uh, writers started doing novels almost immediately. And then that happened almost co uh, coincided with the death of most of the popular magazines. Collier's, Saturday Evening Post. Collier's, Saturday Evening Post, Blue Book, uh, uh, Ladies Home Companion. All of them used vast amounts of, uh, of Short wonderful story stories. material. And uh, now, uh, not even Playboy. Playboy does one or two pieces of fiction a month, and they're always by somebody by Mario Vargas Llosa or Vladimir Nabokov, somebody with a big, with a big cachet name. It's very hard for writers <coughs> excuse me, to learn how to write short stories, except in the genre magazines. There remain science fiction magazines, mystery magazines like Ellery Queens and mm -hmm. Alfred Hitchcock's. Uh, a few Western... Do you still write short stories yourself? Yes, absolutely. I write short stories all the time, and, uh, except now I charge $6,000 for them instead of a penny a word. La-di-da. La-di-da. <laughs> Time to move on. It's one, of the few, it's one of the few perks of hanging in there long enough for them yeah. to give you the it's gold It's a great watch. question, though, because we were talking about that the other night with somebody here. Short story, like all of literature, when we studied literature in high school and had our first exposure to it, Edgar Allan Poe, wonderful right. short stories, yeah. you know. And, 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 well, and the, short story, the short story is, in my view, the most perfect fictional form. A novel can be full of air, can be very windy, can be Ponderous. great. Particularly people who write these trilogies, these endless trilogies. I mean, uh, Tolstoy was able to do War and Peace in one volume. You would think that these people were able to do the, you know, a book without having to go on indefinitely. But people are used to watching television, and television demands continuing series. And so writers do continuing series. Casey, I'm glad you called, and thank you for watching our show tonight. Good question. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. We're going to miss you, and you take care of yourself, buddy. All right, thanks, Casey, and you too. Okay, bye-bye right, now. Bye-bye now. You notice that everybody has very American names tonight, Kip, Casey, yeah. Spike. <laughs> uh, what about uh, the, 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 the curse and the, uh, and the blessing of humanity? Well, somebody... I was... mean, I know you're tough on the human race and you're tough on television, you're tough on... I, I... And I, I'm not as bright as you, but I'm fairly bright. Oh. I, I, I tire of incompetence sometimes, and I, I, I tire of people who could do better and don't. What, what, what about you? What, what, what do you think of all of us, humanity, people? I, I grow to like myself less and less every day because I'm getting meaner and meaner and more and more elitist. In this country, you can say almost anything and get away with it. You know, you can say Eleanor Roosevelt had an affair with a horse. You can say God is dead. Anything you want, but what you cannot say is that some people really are better than others. And it's true. Mm -hmm. Jackie Robinson was better than anybody around him when he was working. Jonas Salk, better. Uh, 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 Ralph Nader, better. <clears throat> there are some people who are quicker, smarter, and care more about the rest of the human race. They contribute more. And uh, by my lights, that makes them better. We worship idiocy today. We worship people in sitcoms who are, who aren't, who are incapable of opening a, a, a lemon jar. And we see movies in which we raise to the level of hero Paulie Shore and Adam Sandler. I mean, it is really a Jerry Springer world. And uh, I find that an intolerable place in which to live. I, who have always worshipped people who were quick with the clever remark, the intellectual remark, the clever remark. I'm not a, not a great, uh, heavy, you know, thinker. I, I, I like watching, you know, the People's Court. And I watched Purgatory on TNT last night and instead of the new 60 Minutes which could, you know, put you to sleep. Uh, I, but, I, but I look around me at the level of incompetence, and it is now tragic. Everywhere you go, the world is, our world, America, is just filled with people who are bumbling imbeciles, and none of whom will accept the responsibility for it. I screw up all the time, but at least I say, yeah, I done it. Now everybody, it wasn't my fault, man, it was the computer done it. Does that answer the question? It answers the question, but what it really says is, and, 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 and th there are people who are better than others, but there are people who you and I might well describe as bumbling idiots who could, if they would just exert a little bit more effort, if they care. rise to a level of competence and get along in this society so much better than they do. If they would just try just a, but, a scotch harder, that's but, all. But, Tom, they are encouraged not to. Everything, that, everything around them, all of society tells them, don't stick your neck out. Don't be, we, we, we laugh at education. Uh, on, on, I was doing Politically Incorrect, 
and I used the word, uh, I was talking about uh, Nixon being dead, and I said, I said I, you know, I'd like to go up and slap him as he lay there on the catafalque. And Mars says to me, catafalque? And I said, yeah, you're going to make fun of good grammar? Uh, if anyone who uses proper language, anyone who would correct someone, uh, you say, oh, who cares? Who knows? Or at least try and raise the bar a little bit. By a using, little bit. By, you, you could have said, uh, you, you know, funeral uh, uh, beer, or you could have said... Well, I did. Uh, yeah, or, I or did say that, but, but it, was, the it was obvious that it was easier to make fun of someone who used a word that what the perception was. But you see, we live in an age where comedy is making fun of people. Politically incorrect makes fun of people. Some late night television programs make fun of people. Situation comedies make fun of groups of people or classes of people. Yeah. And that's not good. That's, I, I think that's a problem. We, we make nothing but fun of people. We reduce everyone to the role of being a buffoon. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I find the people on, on, on The Simpsons much smarter than I do the people on Friends. Uh, I watch neither. I watch everything. I know you do. That's I watch the everything. That's the problem. I read everything. I see all. I know all. And I spend a lot of time in the bathroom. <laughs> it's been quite a ride for you and I, and I thank you for all the good times. Yes. I don't know what the future uh, holds for me or for you, but I thank you for all that we have shared together I will miss. I will miss getting together with you, pal. It's been... It's way over 20 years. Yes, it is. It's a you long once time. told me that I had done your show more than anybody but Chevy Chase, and it's been years since I've seen Chevy on the show. So. I think if you combine all my shows in 73, you are the, uh, you, you're the hands-down champ. Kiddo, thanks. It's been a good ride. Okay, thank you, sir. Harlan Ellison is the guest. Uh, you know his books and you know his writing. It's among the best we have, and I've treasured the time we've spent together. Next, Paul Anka and a wonderful new, uh, wonderful new CD after this break. Paul Anka is a many-hit wonder. He's been writing hit songs, recording, and performing them now for more than 40 years. And this month, he's releasing a brand new album called A Body of Work. It's a pleasure to welcome Paul Anka to CBS. Thanks for coming on. Happy New Year to you. To you too, Tom. Good Let me you. ask you about a contest that you entered as a kid in Canada in which you had to collect soup labels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I was a teenager in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, my mom worked, my dad worked, and I wanted to be in show business. Pop music in those days was in its infancy stage, so nobody quite got it that this young kid wanted to be in this business. And I knew that all the records that I was listening to as a fan came out of New York City, mm -hmm. primarily. And I was reading the newspaper one day because I wanted to be a journalist and I worked at the local newspaper, and there was an ad for IGA Food Stores. And it said if you collected the most soup wrappers, Campbell soup wrappers, yeah. you would win a trip to New York. I said, Wow. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> so I ran to the IG food store in my neighborhood. I took a job. I used to bag all the groceries. Uh -huh. And I'd clock the women that bought the Campbell's soup. And I'd go to their homes after and get the, the soup wrapper. Exactly. Sure. Run in the warehouse in the back, rip off a few, put some new ones in front. <laughs> Long story short, I win the contest for my district. And myself and 40 kids from across Canada were put on a train with little box lunches. Mm -hmm. And they took us down to New York City. And we arrived, and they put me up at the... Uh, Sloan House, YMCA Sloan House. And I sat up there and I looked at this city and I said, this is it. I'm coming Mecca. back. Mecca, Mecca. Listen to Alan Freed. I just, every, everybody I ever loved and listened to their music was playing at the Paramount. And that was where I got bitten. So you went back to Canada yeah. eventually, but then you mm -hmm. went back to New York. Yeah. And I read that you met this man, Don Costa. Mm -hmm. And his job at the time, was he, was he a manager at the time? He was, uh, Don Costa was one of the A&R directors oh, at okay. a new label called ABC Paramount. And I went down a few years later, bought a little money, knew a vocal group called the Rover Boys, and I, they put me up in their bathtub, put a mattress in there, and I did the rounds. And I wound up at ABC Paramount. And Don Costa looked at me. He thought I was delivering a telegram or some food. I said, I'm a songwriter. He said, well, let's listen to you. And I played the piano for him. He said, where are your parents? I said, back up in Canada. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I want to fly him down here. I want to sign a contract. And Don Costa was the one responsible for my career. What did you play for him? Diana. Oh, yeah? You Are My Destiny. <laughs> and Don't Gamble With Love. <laughs> and everybody said, Don't Gamble With Love was the hit. And then we put the record out and flipped over to Diana. Uh -huh. And so Don Costa was the, was the first who took a chance. He was the guy. On Paul Anka. Everybody else locked me in a closet. Now, did not want to hear me. Did, did he have any advice for the, for the young Paul Anka at the time? If, if you were going to be a singer, if you were going to be a songwriter? Um, 
I think Don really worked with me to hone the craft of songwriting. Um, it was more in the area of music and arranging. Other than that, he, he wasn't really into the business acumen sense. That, that all came later from people that I met. Mm -hmm. Don was more artistic. Now, what happened when you, when you started clicking? You know, you just mentioned Diana, you know, which was a huge, huge hit. Mm -hmm. And the other songs that you wrote early on were, were, were enormous hits. How did this change your relationship with young women? Uh, well, prior to that, there was no relationship. <laughs> so I would say it was a, a drastic shock, right? Uh, one that confirmed the fact I got in the right business. Uh, you know, prior to that, I mean, in the 50s, you're a teenager. It's a time of innocence, uh, romance. Uh, you know, at that time, if, if you're lucky to take a girl to a theater and get your arm around and feel the Put left Put your head one, on right? my shoulder and write <laughs> So there, I really didn't have a lot of success back then, nor did a lot of the guys I know. Uh, once I got into that business, obviously, myself and many of the others that were in it, equating to that, uh, you know, life changed for all of us. You know, we missed that tail end of adolescence, and all of a sudden it was traveling and girls and mm -hmm. Italian ones and Japanese, and it was just flavor of the month time, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But it was pretty cool. That's all we thought about, But there actually. was one special woman for you, and that was Annette Funicello. I yeah. remember when she made the album, Annette Sings Anka, and, mm -hmm. and for a time I think you and she were pals, if that would be the way to put it. Yeah, I think we were a little better than pals. Uh, okay. Yeah, we were swapping spit there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but which was a, a major crisis for, uh, for Disney. I mean, yeah, they, but they, I mean, you, you, you were enormous then. She was a huge star coming off of the, Mickey, yes. you know, the Mouseketeers and mm -hmm. that, that, that yeah. sort of thing. She, she was a wonderful person. And uh, I've spoken with her recently. And she's just handling her situation right now as admirably as she's always handled her life. Mm -hmm. But we got very close for a while. And, and Disney was against it. And my managers were against it. And, and that wanted to get married, and of course that wasn't in the scheme of things for me. And when Disney started pulling us apart, they kept saying, it's a puppy love, a puppy love. And I ran down in my basement where I was living in Canada, and I wrote, puppy, puppy love. love. <laughs> and that was for that, yeah. Uh, the call from Frank Sinatra. Right. Mm -hmm. Sinatra is thinking about retiring, and he wants an anthem, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And you come up with one of the classics of all time. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd, I'd met Sinatra back in the very early 60s when I started working in Vegas. And through those years, you know, he'd say to me, hey, kid, he called me the kid, I called him the old man. He said, you're going to write me something, because he really didn't like pop music in the beginning, hated it, you know, because he had that great pool of great American classics. But he started to come around. And I was in Miami at the Fountain Blue Hotel, and he came to see the show, and we hung out a lot, and he said, I'm going to retire, kid, I'm going to retire. I left him in Miami, I went back to New York, where I was living at the time, and around one in the morning, I started playing around. I wrote everything on a typewriter because of my journalist days. And I just started. And now the end is near, and so I face final curtain. And I realized that that was very indigenous to what Sonata was, was about. And I finished it at 5 in the morning. I called Don Costa, who was his a &R man. I'd introduced them, and he became his producer. Mm -hmm. And I said, guys, I've got something. And made a demo, went to Vegas, played it for him at Caesars Palace. He said, kid, that's kooky. And about a month later, he called me in New York, put the phone up to the speaker and said, listen to this. And he played me my way for the first time. One o'clock in the morning on a typewriter, and now the Thunderstorm end Thunderstorm outside. Yeah. Why is it with you guys and gals who write this stuff, it usually is one or two o'clock in the morning, and it's raining outside, uh, it's misty, or it's fall? That, that's probably one of the few times for me. I write anywhere. I've written on airplanes. I wrote She's a Lady for Tom Jones on an airplane on my way back from doing his television show. I've written in buses, uh, Buddy Holly, last song he ever recorded, It Doesn't Matter Anymore. I mm -hmm. wrote that in a bus. Um, I haven't had too many one o'clock in the morning. I usually bleed into one or stay up till six or seven in the morning. We're chatting with Paul Anka. His newest CD is called A Body of Work, which we'll talk about and hopefully be joined by you on the toll free as time permits right after this short break. <laughs> Back with Paul Anka. Here's Felice in Coconut Creek, Florida. Hi, Felice, and welcome to CBS. Hello. Hi, Tom. It's a pleasure to get through to you eventually. <laughs> thank you. I know it's, sometimes it takes a while, Felice, but I thank you for your patience. What's on your mind tonight, young lady? Well, I want to ask Mr. Anka, uh, you know, the, uh, the music business has always been notorious for uh, having scandal, but there was never one iota of scandal against, uh, against Paul Anka. Everything was squeaky clean. 
Well, they'll get me yet. Oh. <laughs> Come on. Uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I think, I don't know, maybe in some cases you kind of ask for it. Some people go in and need that kind of stuff. I, but you, I, you came along before the drugs uh, came oh, in. And... Yeah, well, I was around it. You know what I mean? Frankie Lyman was next to me shooting up heroin, and you kind of you looked at it all and said, well, which way am I going to go, left or right? Mm -hmm. the or straight were, ahead, right? Yeah, and it's, at 16, I just realized that, you know, you know, all of this incredible dream came true. And if I want to stay in it, I just got to stay closer to the line as opposed to left or right. Mm -hmm. And you make a choice. You know, you just make a choice as to keeping the integrity and keeping what you do, uh, you know, very professional and, and be responsible. Well, that's great. Thank I have you. one other question to ask you. Yeah. You set such a great example for your family. Have any of your daughters followed in your footsteps? Well, my daughter called from London today. She just started a rock and roll group. She had her first concert tonight, and she's on my new album. She sings with me in a song called Do I Love You with Kenny G and uh, Barry Gibb. And she'll be with me on my TV special that I'm shooting March 7th, and she'll be singing with myself and Celine Dion on that show. Wow. And I'll be in Florida. I start a tour there on February 10th for two weeks. Where do you live? I'm in Coconut Creek uh, near Fort Lauderdale. Well, I'll be in Fort Lauderdale on February 16th, and you have two tickets from me. Oh, really? Yes, you do. Oh, thank you. If you just you. stay on the line, we'll get your number, and we'll call you. Okay. Oh, thank you. All Thanks right. for the call. All right. Keep her on the line. Thanks, Felice, and have a nice evening, okay? Thank you. All right. Bye-bye now. Tough to keep them on the line sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> now, you, you are out 45, 40 weeks a year performing. Yeah, average about 30 to 40. And I read that you, that you really don't tire of that because every night the audience, as Peter Allen used to say in his song, mm -hmm. entertains you. You watch them as you entertain them. You know, I change my format depending on the country I'm in because sure. I travel, you know, to every major country all the time. And by and large, when you're in front of an audience, most of them, in some cases, have never seen you before. Mm -hmm. And the songs that, that I've been a part of all of these years mean a lot to these people. Sing the ones they know. And I just sing what they want to hear, and I, you know, I keep it interesting for me. And the audience is the turn-on. So you can never get in that mode of, I'm bored of singing what got me here. I don't retire songs. Mm -hmm. And the audience is the difference. If you entertain them and, and really are into it, don't throw it away, you've got a great shot of having a good time. Yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Here's That's Johnny. That's called the, uh, my high school, my high school song. It put five kids through school. <laughs> <laughs> How did that come about, the uh, theme for the Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson? I was asked to do a special for Granada TV in Great Britain. And we wanted a little comedy relief. And somebody sent me a, a tape of this guy doing a kiddie program. But he drank all night. When he showed up with these kids, they started screaming and yelling. He's ready to kill the kids. And I thought it was very funny. Anyway, it was Johnny Carson. And I said, this guy is funny. And he flew over, did the show, uh, went back to New York, and lo and behold, his management company were in the same building I was in, and I ran into him. And he said, I'm doing the show, da, 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 the Tonight Show, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I'm looking to change this, change this. And he said, I want to do a new theme. You know, that's like asking the Pope to bless you. That's right. I said, you got it. And I gave him the theme, not knowing, obviously, that it would last that long and made a demo, sent it over to him, and on it went. And just for an insurance policy, I gave him a piece of the song, because I didn't think I'd last a year. <laughs> the same happened with Daryl Zanuck, actually. I was in a film called The Longest Day, and uh, Mr. Zanuck said, no romance, no music. I went, Ooh. And we're all climbing the beaches and spending time. And I said, you know, Mr. Zanuck, I got this melody in my head, no romance, no music. Ooh. I said, well, I'm going back to New York. I'm going to do a demo. I'm going to send it to you. He said, I'm not guaranteeing you anything. I said, let me, I'll, I'll pay for it. Send it to him. So he sends me a telegram back. You got it. It's the only music in the film. And he said, love it. And that was it. Twelve minutes in the three and a half hours. Now, how did the CD that we're talking about tonight, the body of work, come about? I think somebody suggested that if you were to have one more CD on the charts, yeah. you'd become the first artist to have a CD or album on the top charts for four or five consecutive decades. Actually, um, uh, someone at Billboard magazine had, had written an article a couple of years ago and said that if I get a top 50 record uh, here in 99, I'll be the first performer to ever have five consecutive decades of top 50 records. That's 50 years, Paul. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I did an album last year for Sony called Amigos, a Spanish album, which just went gold. And the feedback was we'd love it in English. So I went in and I did this album in English and I called up friends, you know. David Foster produced it with Walter Afanasyev. 
and I wanted Sinatra. We have Sinatra, Celine Dion, who I think is one of the great performers of all time, Patti LaBelle, uh, Peter Cetera, Tevin Campbell, Kenny G, and on and on. You and Frank uh, 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 duet my way here. Yes, you sing do. along with, uh, with, with his re recording of it. Yeah. I, I wanted him on the album. Obviously, due to his health, he couldn't be there. Surely. And I thank Tina Sinatra, actually, and her family for arranging to give me the original tape that was made back in the 60s. Because of the technology, I was able to fly, take his performance out of that tape, put it in a computer. I took the computer, we went over to Capitol Records, where he did his records, Symphony Orchestra, Johnny Mandel. We all started together, he sang with me, and that's how we made the record. Mm -hmm. As you do that, does a little eerie feeling come over you? Oh, yeah. I mean, a very emotional. It's, it, you know, it's, that song was very important for me, and, and he was a very special guy. I mean, this was a one of a kind, there'll never be anybody mm -hmm. like him. And he was the guy. He was the guy. And doing that was very emotional for me. It's very nice to see you, my friend. Thanks for coming on. Continued success. And thanks for the memories. All Thank the great songs. Paul Anka is the guest. And the new CD. Bless you, sir. Happy New Year now. Thank you. The new CD is called A Body of Work. The guest is Paul Anka. We'll be right back after this short break. Uh, tomorrow night, Howie Mandel, who is a star in television syndication, joins us, and Mr. John or Jan Schlickman, the man upon whom the film A Civil Action is based, the real-life story, uh, tomorrow night on this program. Uh, you know, I liked hearing the old Johnny Carson song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, you know, he doesn't use it anymore. The difference between a golf ball and a G-spot is that guys will spend 20 minutes looking for a golf ball. Good night, everybody. <laughs>